Hello, this is Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network every Thursday at 1 p.m. And you can also find me on the Conscious Resistance YouTube channel and Conscious Resistance uh, website. So today we have Elisa Hawk, who is uh, an Australian comedian, healer, massage therapist, and anarchist, um, who will tell us a little bit about her status as a perpetual world traveler. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Alisa, t t tell us uh, how you became an anarchist. I, mm, I think everyone's an anarchist. We're obviously all born anarchists. We're free and we shouldn't have rulers. I mean, that's ridiculous to take authority from anybody. I mean, even as a kid, I didn't like taking authority from anyone. Oh, don't start me on <laughs> bloody Christian Grey. Uh, what's that book called? Fifty Shades of Grey. The right? movie? The yeah, don't start me on that. But yeah, most of the time I don't like authority. <laughs> most and of the time. And so we <laughs> It's so obvious. It's psychology 101. If anybody has studied psychology out there, it's like you can pick who is what and what is who and all that. And it does probably have a lot to do with being spanked as children, let's face it. That's another topic we need to talk about. Oh yeah. <laughs> And what was the question, Danilo? <laughs> no, I just wonder how, how you became or like maybe what influenced you, you know, what books or personalities influenced your, your way of thinking. Oh, I, I haven't really studied anything apart from the things that come before me for free because I never buy anything like books. I haven't lived in a house for a long, long time and I, I've lived out of a suitcase for at least six years and I feel like everything before that I was a different world. but. We're all anarchists and we, we're meant to be anarchists. We're not meant to be ruled over. It's just that they've brainwashed us so well to really be scared of a world without police, a world without judges. We were all so well brainwashed to believe that they are the glue that holds our society in a nice place. Without police and judges, who would pick up the rubbish? You know, without police and judges, who would who would sweep the streets? It's like not police and judges, but you know, it's almost like if we don't if we don't get our rubbish collected by the government, who will drone bomb the kids in Pakistan? I mean, it's the other way around. But you know, I we all love what a great society can create. It's just that we've been brainwashed to think that we have to accept every other thing that that entails like going for these budgets for war, unending war on people that we know they make up these bullshit false flag events to blame it on other people if we do a few hours research and if we have the freedom to say it. Most people know this shit but they don't have the freedom to say it because they're locked into a 40 year mortgage and a job that they have to hold down to pay that mortgage and if they go to their job as a school teacher or a lawyer or anything else and say oh 9-11 I don't think a building can turn to dust by jet fuel you know then everybody's gonna out them in the local school circle or at the local lunchroom in the law office and they're gonna go oh so and so's a bit kooky aren't they <laughs> so therefore everybody's subtly controlled by it's and really the thing is people just go I don't know enough about that to make a call on that like maybe those buildings did turn to dust from jet fuel and the thing is we do know enough about shit to make a call on stuff like people say to you, me how do you know what you know and it's because I've learned to trust myself I spend a lot of time researching things that I want to know and I use critical thinking which means cross-referencing um, meeting people going out and learning about things personally seeing how they make me feel experiencing time with people and realizing wow they're very different from how I thought they were for the last 10 years of following their work you know I've learned a lot of things lately about just don't follow anyone we're all flawed we're all fucked up we're all hopeless we're all stupid we're all ugly all of our shit stinks and all of us have a God inside us that's beautiful and loving and all of us can be sexy and attractive at different times and ugly and so why the fuck are we caught in all this judgment all the time when we're all exactly the same well said <laughs> I, uh, I, I, I like your approach uh, especially with comedy, because I used to do stand-up comedy also, and uh, you know I find that using comedy is a wonderful way to spread um, difficult and painful truths to people. You know, it's like an icebreaker, right? People um, they get immediately defensive if you start attacking what they believe, you know, for most of their life. But if you start making jokes and you get them to laugh a little bit, 
then you can you can you can slide these uh, these gems into their brain and they're more easily accepted, right? So that's why I love. Uh, I for me, my experience, and I even noticed this because I watched a little of your comedy, and uh, I really enjoyed it. But I just want to say I noticed that what happens is laughing right is an involuntary physical action you don't choose when you laugh it just happens you can go <laughs> but that's choosing to laugh or something can make you literally have that laughing spasm so it's a diaphragmatic involuntary reaction and when people laugh at something because it's true when they don't admit that truth in their daily life and then they come to your comedy gig and they laugh at a joke because deep down they know 9-11 was bullshit or they know something else didn't happen the way we're told it happened, then I find what those people do is they're sort of shocked by the fact that their own laughter is showing them, oh yeah, there is some shit around that. It's like when you first watch George Carlin talking about you are owned, people, it's a big club and you ain't in it. And you fir first time you see that, you have that realization like oh wow it's like a big light is shine shone on things it's like the first time I saw George Carlin shit about save the planet like people we do not need to save the planet the planet <laughs> is fucking fine the people are fucked you know and and you you look at shit from a new perspective and you realize how much you've been brainwashed all your life to think oh yeah we need to save the planet you know <laughs> Yeah, save the planet from the uh, the U.S. military, from the drone strikes, from the nuclear nuclear detonations. Oh, from the <laughs> that's what we need to save the planet. From. <laughs> yeah, I was watching something today about army American army generals talking about the global warming initiatives the army is helping out with, and I'm like, oh, guys, just stop <laughs> shooting, leaving depleted uranium all over the Middle East. That would be the best thing you guys could do. I'm not worried about the fucking sea rising five centimeters because that one, I don't even believe that global warming is an issue that, 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 that governments can help us solve by taking our money, that's all. And then two, I also think, oh man, we, we're fucked if, if, if people think the army can help us with global warming. <laughs> We're just going to take guns and, and shoot at global warming, <laughs> shoot at the carbon dioxide. Yeah. That's, that's how you're going to solve it. <laughs> it's like the war on terror. It's like next is going to be the war on pain and then the war on bleeding and then we're going to have the war on death. It's basically the war, <coughs> the war on words, right? You just pick an adjective <laughs> and then go to war against it. <laughs> That's what all this that's what all this thought crime stuff is, you know? Like in Australia right now, I've got friends, actually comedians or people who thought they were comedians, but they're not comedians, man, because they are on this bandwagon to stop a woman coming getting a visa to come to Australia to talk against vaccines. And I'm like, what modern day person? It's like book burning. Like can't you just live and let live? If you don't want vaccines, if you want to have vaccines, have them. But don't stop somebody else from coming to the country to talk about any subject. You know, I remember in the 80s, we, we took people, we, we, took, we kicked people out of the country who were coming to Australia who were Holocaust deniers or Holocaust revisionists. And these days, you can't do that anymore because they've had to change the plaque at Auschwitz. A lot of things have... Beca we've become aware that a lot of things that we were told about the Holocaust have been not the way that we were told, you know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I mean, t take any uh, any history historical event in public school, and uh, you can take it apart with a fine tooth comb, you know, <laughs> and you can reveal a lot of a lot of inaccuracy. With a, a Often the opposite is true. Oh yeah. That's what spins me up. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you just have to look at what. What is funding the government schools, right? You know, if if it's if it's uh, you know stolen tax money that's funding the, the the government schools, of course you're going to get taught historical facts that are going to be supporting supportive of the government, right? <laughs> and it's going to yeah, gonna, you know, and and the whole purpose of the system in the first place from the Prussian, you know, indoctrination, schooling them like fish and everything else, it's it's. Oh, yeah. It's unfolding. So you're you're a homeschooler. Tell me, how is it to have kids? Oh. How is it to be a parent? How is it to 
homeschool. High five, bro, because if I did have kids, I always think I'd homeschool them. And my friends go, Alyssa, fuck off. If you had kids, you'd have nannies by the time you got home from the hospital, which isn't true, actually. I, I think I wouldn't have nannies that soon, maybe two weeks in. But no, how's homeschooling? Oh, so, yeah, so my kids are a four-and-a-half, four-and-a-half-year-old son and two-and-a-half-year-old daughter. And um, so a lot of people ask me, you know, I guess they're still at the age where I can still say, you know, you know, they say, are they in school yet? And I say, no, they're not in school yet. They're four-and-a-half. Oh, okay, maybe they're going to kindergarten when they're five. <laughs> so I, I, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. No, they're going to university, thanks, because I've been hot-footing them at home. Yeah. This know. one's into algebra, and this one's a home decorator. I mean, yeah, my kids, they just, um, especially my son, he's, you know, asking questions now, <clears throat> like, you know, um, you know, how do robots make clothes? How do robots make shoes? How, you know, how do, how do robots make toothpaste? You know, and, and so I just show him a video on YouTube of a, of a factory that's making toothpaste, and he's just riveted. You know, he's focused on it because he loves to learn oh. about it. And, and just imagine, like, what four-and-a-half-year-old loves to look at a factory? You know, like and what, and what isn't on YouTube? Like every subject on earth has course. something on YouTube. Of course, I mean, yeah. But, but I'm saying that the questions that they that, that he asks, that's the perfect time for education. That's when he's really ready. Yeah, to when learn. he wants to know. Oh yeah. Yeah. oh yeah. So so that's what you got to take advantage of, and you can't you can't let that up. You know, and so you know he's he, he asks all kinds of questions. You know, you know what? How far is the moon? What, what's the moon made of? You know, <laughs> things like that. <laughs> um, yeah, but it's wonderful. Um, I, you should tell. You should tell. The moon, darling, is two hundred and forty-nine thousand kilometers away. That's a quarter of a million miles. Actually, that's miles away. That's two hundred and forty thousand miles further than any space shaft craft has gone since nineteen seventy-one. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I, gotta, I gotta tell him that the next time. <laughs> but uh, I just love to to this girl Lali here like she's 25. I just talk to her all day about quantum physics and whatever, half in English, half in my bad Spanish. And she just loves it. She she doesn't tune out. She actually listens more in a different way. She's like, oh, there's something there worth listening to rather than if I'm going, a sad boy doesn't get a biscuit. <laughs> so, so tell me, how's, how's uh, life in Mexico since you moved there recently? It's great. It's up and down. Always my life is up and down. I'm sort of a depressive, manic, crazy person in my own way. Like I I am a real introvert and I spend a lot of time going right into myself. I could spend three months in a room easily, you know. Wow. But, uh, but then I'm also a real extrovert. Yeah, like I'm really looking forward to Anacapulco, the conference in two weeks in Acapulco. Yeah, yeah. It's, do you know about it? Of course. I've yeah, it's the anarchist. Yeah. I would love yeah, to Yeah, you there. should come, but oh. I guess it's like impossible right now. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Oh. I know you have to get the whole family and passports and crap like that, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's ridiculous. And, uh, to yeah. get back into the States, you need a passport, yeah. Actually, the, the woman... Um, you could just say it. The, the woman, Dana Martin, are you familiar with her? The, she's a radical unschooler. I've heard her. Yeah, I just, yeah, I just, heard I, her one of her I just interviewed her a few days great. ago. So, so uh, she was Great. a really, really awesome woman, and she's going to be there uh, talking about, you know, radical end school. I think she's giving a work workshop, right, in, in a few days. Yeah, well, I would do it, except lucky for me, I'm really only raising a friend's puppy, and I'm fully into the full-on aggression pup policy with dogs. You know, <laughs> when a dog shits on your bed, you need to rub its nose in it, tap it on the nose. <laughs> And outside, I, you cannot reason with a dog. You can't connect with a dog. Well, you can connect, but you do have to tap them on the nose. But kids, I am totally don't believe in hitting kids. And I can say that because I don't have any. <laughs> yeah. But I, mean, I really think it's bad. Wrong. It's fucked up. It's so fucked up. And it, it must be incredibly hard to be a parent. I notice even babysitting my friend's kid, how frustrated I get. Certain days, certain times, certain moods. It's impossible to be a parent. But I don't think I'd let myself hit my kid if I had one. Not even small smack, you know, like, I just think it, it's what prepares us for statism. Oh, yeah. I really oh, do. Yeah, definitely. I think it prepares us to accept the cops coming with batons. And it's like, oh, mummy and daddy used to do this when I was a kid. So if the state wants to lock me up and give me time on the naughty mat, it can, you know? <laughs> 
Yeah, it's true. I, I uh, before we had kids, you know, I, I um, you know, I was also like, uh, you know, if my kid is going to be do something bad, I'm just going to hit him. You know, it, it just makes sense because that's how I was brought up. But, but, but you know, I, uh, I, I started learning about stuff. Yeah, I, I was learning about stuff. I'm all new, peaceful parenting, and um, and learned about you know many things like that, and and it changes your pers- my perspective has really changed. You know, with his his approach, and so I really realized that you know kids are people also <laughs> they're not property they're not your oh, slave yeah. right and they deserve yeah. respect also because they didn't choose to be your kids right you know they're basically your prisoners yeah. so, so you you have to treat them yes. in a way that they're going to so l- love being your child that, that if they had a choice between other parents yeah. that they would willingly choose you yeah. right oh babe you are so lovely your <laughs> kids will choose you all the time don't worry but you're right it is you do have to connect with them and not control them it's this is a person you're going to know all your life if you're cool to them yeah if you're not cool to them they can fucking go anywhere and lots of kids do go and live on the streets rather than put up with any any bullshit mm-hmm. any kind of even power tripping used to drive me insane from a very young age mm-hmm. I remember when I was about three or four years old saying to, my dad was doing, getting me in trouble for something and I remember looking at him and in my head I remember thinking, yeah, 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 just fucking calm down, dude. Like you're not better than me. You've just been here longer, you know. You've just, you just, you've just had a few more times practicing opening the can, you know, like yeah. or something like that. He might have been trying to teach me long division, and I got so mad at him. And I just remember looking at him like, <laughs> you fucking actually think you're better than me? No, no, no. You've just had a bit more practice. Yeah. <laughs> It's like when I was a kid, they asked me if I wanted to train as an Olympic swimmer and I was like, why would I want to swim up and down a pool all day just to show people I had swum up and down a pool all day? <laughs> I never had that kind of competitive spirit. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, it's funny when I tell, um, you know, my family that, that we don't, you know, about the, the unschooling and about, you know, no spanking uh, and about no vaccines and about, you know, various things like that. Um, and when you when you want to raise your children in a different way that your parents raised you, sometimes they take that as an, a personal attack on the way they raised you. Oh, I bet they do. You know, and I bet they do. My mom always made jokes with me. She said, "If you have kids and I babysit them, I'll take them down and get them bloody vaccinated." Uh, and I'm like, "Mom, that's why I'm not leaving my children with you." You know. Yeah. And and mum says, you know, I know that they'd be giving them lollies and treats and whatever, Coca-Cola when I wasn't there. And then they'd be like, we love grandma. And I'd be like, no, you love fucking Coca-Cola and so do I. And that's why I've got some hidden in the top cupboard. But you're not ready for it yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's very sad how... That was... Yeah, yeah, I mean, I mean, we, we make these choices or I make these choices because of the, of the things that we've researched, things that we've learned, you know, books we've read. Um, and it's not to anger our family that we choose these decisions, right? We do it because we consider them right and moral and humane way to raise children. And not only, yeah, and also I think for us it's a much bigger realization that we've been used, screwed with really badly and that these little things that we think are just normal, just the way things are, when we think things are just the way they are, then we just keep going along with it. But it, we really have to challenge each other about things that are stupid, like, you know, smacking a kid with violence to control a behavior when really what we're supposed to be doing is showing them their choices and the results of their choices. So, so were you, your, your parents were, uh, were also pretty violent with you, spanking and all that? <laughs> Do, is, it, does, is it that fucking obvious? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> Just no, asking. I love my mum and dad ever more than anyone. They're the best parents ever, and they always have been. But yeah, they were. They smacked me. My mum went wild on me with the feather duster a few times. One time, I jumped out my bedroom window, got in my car, and drove to my boyfriend's house. So I was like seventeen. I had a driver's license. Wow. But I was rude, and I was a bitch. I was a feisty and 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 outrageously rude bitch 
And if I was my mother, I probably would have done exactly the same thing. So therefore, I, when I have kids, if I am ever lucky enough to have them, I would like to evolve that behavior somewhat, but I don't expect that I would be able to. I think if I had a kid over a 20 or 30 or 40 year period of parenting it, that it's quite likely that I'll lash out and lose my temper sometime. It's not a matter of, you know, if we fuck up sometimes, because emotions take over all of us at times, but it's just about setting principles and saying we don't want to control each other with violence, but occasionally I may still hit you if you really annoy me. Well, I mean, you, you, I mean, force itself is not is not evil, right? There's a difference between the initiation force and, and self defense, right? So, so a child, exactly. a child, let's say who who defends himself against his parents or hits back, that's not really immoral, right? <laughs> it's just defense. Well, it's not at all. And I remember a time, and I don't want to make my family sound dysfunctional because we're just as dysfunctional as every family. But I remember a day when my older brother was having a bit of argy-bargy with my dad and, you know, he was 16 or 17. And, and it was the day that my older brother kind of said to my dad, I'll fucking call you back this time if you try and forcibly control me with your body and I remember my mum and I watching on like oh my god this is like watching a David Attenborough documentary like these two are going to tear each other <laughs> apart like lions and luckily they both calmed down yeah. but all families have that I'm sure they do and if they don't I think they have something far scarier yeah, I mean, I, I mean, you know, nobody's perfect, and I feel sometimes I lose my temper also. But you know, you have to catch yourself, you have to calm yourself down, and you have to, you know, think what kind of lesson am I teaching my kid by losing my temper, or even by yeah. resorting to violence when I'm when I lost my temper, right? And, yeah, uh, absolutely. You know, even silence can be violence. Smashing a cup on the ground can be violence. I've done violent things myself. I threw an iron at a boyfriend when I was in my younger days. And, wow. you know, I could have killed somebody at times. And um, I'm glad that I'm not in jail with a 50-year jail sentence for one moment of aggression that I had. Yeah, yeah. I also took other boyfriend's clothes and put them on the front lawn and put, through, put the hose all over them when he came home, everything wet and you know if somebody did that to my clothes I would kill them <laughs> you know I, I love my clothes and I don't want them wet so I know I'm unreasonable and that's life that's the joy of life is that our actions fall outside of those boring self-contained limits that we want most of the time thank God they fall outside those limits sometimes because that's that's where life really is that's where all the the juice is that's like the black keys on the piano mm -hmm. that makes <laughs> nice. the music nice piano oh yeah, yeah. piano's awesome <laughs> so so um oh, you love piano too. Oh, oh yeah i'm a big time piano player for since i was 12 years old um yeah. you got to have a jam today man i love piano it's my favorite instrument i i have never played the piano apart from chopsticks on my grandma's piano a bit as a kid but then i got a piano like a, a year or two before i left australia it was a 140 year old piano and it was a little out of tune but just perfectly with itself it sounded honky tonk and oh man piano is just the happiest sound in the world but i can hardly play it because the beauty of it is it almost shatters me <laughs> so so tell me tell me why you love um uh, Fifty Shades of Grey. <laughs> That's always a fun topic. <laughs> uh, sure. Uh, yeah, like, let's talk about it. Like, it's taken the world by storm, which has basically shown me I'm not that much of a freak and probably... I think a lot of women probably like it because it's like he picks her up in a glider and he buys her a five thousand dollar Louis Vuitton whatever, and I'm not interested in any of that shit. I'm totally into the hardware store and the, the sexual side of it. But the, that's only because I don't know. I love hardware stores. <laughs> I've had this thing for ferreterias. Uh, <laughs> I love plumbing gear. Nice. I don't know. No, I, I was always very, I remember when I was young and I was sort of first finding out about sex and feeling my way through sex and because I'm a really outgoing and strong and domineering and everybody thinks I'm a lesbian basically kind of girl and I have muscles and 
I don't know. Because I'm like that, I think a lot of boys think that I want to like tie them up and stick a pepper grinder up their ass. But I'm not into that shit. Like I want to be the one tied up. I want to be the one like I and then you feel bad wanting that because it goes against feminism and oh god, women, we've got to be on top and the power and all that shit. It's like I want to be on top and the I want to be in control of everything. I want to be the boss of everything all the time in my life. Except for when I'm fucking my boyfriend. <laughs> you know, like give me a break every now and then. Let me just lay there like Paris Hilton and be a starfish. And if you have to tie me, then that just makes me, you know, that just makes it easy. And you don't have to pretend. <laughs> yeah, 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 I've been hearing a lot about how, how Fifty Shades of Grey, you know, people are criticizing like it's, you know, supportive of rape and domestic abuse. Um, but it's the women that love it, though. It's not like the men that love it and go out and you know subjugate their women, right? It's the women that that go and watch the movie. So the, they're actually, it's not. Really you know why? You know why women love it? Because men like that are really rare. Men who like one. A lot of women read romance novels because they're in an actual relationship and no actual relationship is glorious or fun all the time or anything, you know, no actual real relationship lives up to a book or any kind of romance bullshit like that. And a lot of women just like it for the romance of it, but I think a lot of women also are like, the, the men who take charge of women these days are really rare. It's an old-fashioned thing. Back in the 20s, the 30s, a man would be like, here's your coat, dear, and let me open the door for you, and I've booked your flight, and this, I've ordered you the steak, and all of that. And, and then women sort of, with women's lib and everything, which, you know, the more you research, the more you realize it was a Rockefeller-funded and sponsored campaign as much as it was also a desire for women to have equal political power as, as their counterparts. But uh, you start to realize that it is, we are hardwired to receive in that way as women. We are hardwired to give ourselves in that way to men. We are the receiving receptacles as such and they are the penetrating force and all of that. It's as old as the hills. But nothing made it okay until I heard Angelina Jolie talking about being submissive. And then I realized, obviously, women who are quite powerful and strong and independent, um, they really like a man who comes in and just wipes the floor with that bullshit because... <laughs> Why are we talking about this? I do need a husband, though. So if anyone's out there, you just, just consider this my audition tape. Nice. <laughs> I can cook. Oh, I'm a fucking crazy bitch. I was talking to my friend Tiger Lily today, and her boy, her husband and her have been married for 30 years or something, and he's the coolest guy. He just supports her and backs her up on her all her anarchist principles, all her cop-fighting stuff, and... I'm like, there is a man out there crazy enough for some real wild cats, but, you know. <laughs> I like being single, too. I am devoted to God. I gave my life over to God six years ago. Not when I say God, I just mean the glorious all. I don't mean a man in the sky or any religion or anything. I just mean the sand of the stars, the galaxies. I gave myself to that, and I, I don't p try and make my own plans anymore. I try and just say, you tell me what you want to do next, and I'll do it by what is exciting. And then I feel like I'm working for the greatness of all. And that's why I make every single Facebook comment I make or any single massage I do or any single comedy joke I make. It's all for the perpetuation of humans growing out of this enslavement. Because that's what we have to do right now while it's fresh. But you have to pay your taxes. I think it's the time. <laughs> <laughs> Taxes, schmaxes. <laughs> you know what? You don't have to pay your taxes if you learn to be a citizen of the world. A citizen of the world, nobody can tax you because they don't own you. It's, oh, yeah. it's fucking easy, especially for an American. Or You just go down over the border, catch a bus. You know, you can, it's so easy for you guys. You should, you're insane if you don't live half the year in Mexico or in Canada or in any other part of Central America or Europe or anywhere, but I would be making other options. Anybody on earth should be making options to be light-footed in the next 20 years because to me it looks like there could be a really major war or man-made event or maybe harp-made event or major earthquake or something 
could be Yellowstone National Park or it could be an, a sun pulse, but the way the military is set up to overtake the people in the first world countries these days makes me very suspicious and think that it's set up that way because it's planned to happen. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and you're not, you're not going to get out of New York City if something happens in a hurry. You're not going to be able to get out of there. You're going to be their victim. That Whatever they want to do with you, unless you work out some way to go rogue and it's not going to be easy when it comes to a martial law situation but I don't know I am a panicker like I said to my friend I would have said this to you in 2009 as well and like it's 2015 now and nothing's happened so maybe you got another six good years ahead of you but I don't think so I think the Boston bombing fakery I think the I think it's really all hotting up Nothing happened other than you know the drone strikes in Yemen, Somalia, Pakistan, right? The invasions, the occupations, Syria. the assassinations. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing yeah. other than that. Yeah. <laughs> other yeah. than that, nothing <laughs> happening to the Americans really, apart from martial law on Boston in 2013. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've discussed with my wife about um, you know moving to another country, but it's very difficult with her because um, you know she came from. Romania. She grew up in, under communism, and so she was like, talk about strict what? statism. You know, she re was really, yeah. um, you know, under. I just a had a Russian boyfriend. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> I just, I just had a Russian boyfriend. I learned about a little bit about what communism was like, and I was like, wow, I did, I, ne I need to study history, man. I have no idea. Mm -hmm. They can make whole countries of people live like that. Yeah. It's like yeah. yes, Alyssa. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's amazing. Um, yeah, so she grew up in that, and so you know, it's in, it's deeply ingrained in her that you know you have to go to school, you have to get a job, you have to obey the law, you have to pay your taxes, you know, all these things you just have to do. And beautiful that you have come together. Like this is what the world is doing now. It is forcing these polar opposites to come together and work out which one's going to crumble and which one's going to thrive. Mm -hmm. Because really, a lot of the time, something is righter and something is wronger, and we can tell from what how it feels to us. But it's hard to tell how it feels to us because everything else around us and all the lights and glitter and action is telling us the opposite, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I mean... Uh yeah, so my wife, you know, she still clings to a lot of uh, indoctrinated fear, uh, which is very difficult to dispel, because you know when you go through twelve, you must, well, you must be the most annoying husband on earth for a woman like that. But <laughs> I'm so proud that you still manage to hold yourself intact, Danilo, because I think you're really special, and I think that even with a wife and kids and all those commitments to be able to hold true, true to your ideals is really powerful and wonderful. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, my wife sometimes uh, doesn't uh, uh, doesn't feel comfortable with the things that I write <laughs> or post or you know the articles and videos uh, that I talk, you know, the things I talk about because you know she feels like I'm drawing attention to myself, um, you know, from the government, yes. right? You know, but uh, but you yeah, know, I, but I. Oh. I tell her there's bigger people. There's bigger people than me. You know, I'm a small person. <laughs> um, you know, there's that's, I think that's wonderful. I had this discussion with a friend of mine from um, the People's Voice called Ken O'Keefe, and he's a very well-known, very militant activist against all war and all. He's a humanitarian, and he goes really strong against Israel and. Um, you know, he, he said to me, I know I'm just the sort of guy that they would love to kill me and kill my wife and kids and say it was a murder-suicide and all that. Mm. And I said, how do you keep going even though you know it could happen to your kids? And I already knew the answer myself. Really, the answer is because this is the work we're here to do. We're making a better world for everyone, not just our kids. We can't just shut up all of these ideals because we want everything to go smooth for our little family. We want things to be good for people in Somalia and for people in Syria and Iraq and America and Australia in two generations, three generations. We don't want it just to be good for us. We just want our money now so that we can stay rich and fat. No, we want to think about what's good for humanity all over. 
And that's how we all have to start acting and stop thinking about, oh, it's just, oh, I'm all right, Jack, you know. I've got to just, as long as I feed my family, fuck that. Let your fucking kids starve. Some of us have to start thinking about billions of, of all of us now and for many years into the future, 50 years, we have to start looking, 100 years. What are the plans of our owners for us in the next 50 and 100 years? I mean, you're looking at the Hunger Games at the minimum in 50 years. That's what our owners want to do to us in 50 years. But we don't have a 50-year long-term plan. All we care about is, am I getting enough money to feed myself and keep my, paying my mortgage and keep my little nice life and all that? It's like, I'd rather starve on the street. I'd rather my own kids even starve. I hate to say it, but I think all of us have to start thinking about our aspect, our connectedness to everything and everyone. Yeah, and having said that, I want a bacon sandwich for dinner, so that doesn't apply to bacon. <laughs> if I if I self censor myself because I feel like something might happen to me or my kids, I feel like that's the 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 lesson that that teaches my kids is that you know you should fear authority and you should fear those people that are more powerful and that have all the guns. And and that some of glorious you that was given to you or a product of your mechanics and your cells or maybe you are a receiver for something grander that's come through you, who are you to decide that you should censor it? And who is anyone else to ever decide to censor what you may be channeling from outside of yourself? or what you may have brought up from and grown from within yourself. Nobody should ever censor anybody, ever, because we need to accept that that is a part of us, whoever it is, Pol Pot, Hitler, it doesn't matter who it is, it's a part of us. Mm -hmm. It might be a part of us that we don't like, it's a part of us. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, talking about dictators, you know, I, um, I, I like to think about um, uh, Larkin Rose, who, who basically said that, you know, I'm not afraid of the dictators, of the Pol Pot, the Hitlers, the, the, you know, the Stalins, those people don't fear me because those people did not murder millions of people, right? It was the, the idiots, yeah. the status, the, you know, the order followers. That doing you know, their job. That did, just yeah. doing their job are the ones that committed all the evil things that we learn about in the history books, the genocides, the wars, you know, the democide, mass murder. Those. I bet you, I bet you. Yeah, a lot of people wouldn't have the stomach to do the soldier's job of killing mm -hmm. with the actual physical weapons. But a lot of soldiers wouldn't have the stomach to decide who's to be killed. And they'd just rather take the job of being bossed around. So everybody plays a different part at a different time. And if we're eternal, it doesn't matter what part we play. If we are eternal, then I'll kill you this le lifetime. Next lifetime, you can kill my kid. The lifetime after that, your kid can kill my cousin. You know, and we'll all just go around and it'll be a big collage. And it doesn't matter when we know we are the spirit. Mm -hmm. But the material does matter when we're here because, you know, if, if you do something stupid, you have to live for 40 or 50 or 100 or 80 years with the pain of that act on your conscience. It's a long life, man, when you hate yourself. For oh, yeah. something you've done. Yeah, yeah. H have you seen uh, the movie American Sniper? I'm, I'm sure. No. I'm sure you've heard. You've heard about it, though, right? I've heard a little about it. I, all I know is that that fucking shill, fucking oh yuck, Boston bomb shill actor Bradley Cooper got the main role in it, and he also shilled himself with Jeff Borman at the Boston bombing hoax, the guy who supposedly got two legs blown off and then got wheeled for 400 metres in a stretcher past an ambulance, didn't pass out even though both his legs had been blown off, <laughs> sitting there smiling on the wheelchair. All that, that's who Bradley Cooper is, and I wouldn't pay money to see that movie if you tied me down and stole my bank card because I hate those assholes. But tell me about it. How was it? No, I didn't see it either. I heard it's horrible nasty. I didn't see it either. I mean, No, nah, just people tell me it's really nasty propaganda and it makes Iraqi people look like dumb pigs and animals. Actually, and it I, makes Americans look like superheroes. Actually, I've heard that, that Clint Eastwood, the one who, who directed it, is actually, um, he has libertarian leanings. So his, his desire was to make war seem you know, horrific and, you know, uh, like an atrocity. And, and so, you know, he depicted, that's why he depicted Chris Kyle killing, you know, a woman and her child, 
um, you know, from <laughs> from like a, you know, I don't know, hundreds of meters away. Well, and- if he really if he really wanted to be controversial, he should have put in the scene where you know they fucked little boys in front of their mothers, the soldiers and stuff like that, which has been coming out in the last month. If you really want to be controversial, talk about what's controversial. Not shooting a woman and a child. Everyone shoots women and children. I could shoot a woman and a child. But can you fuck? At, can you tell me those big macho soldiers hold down little boys and fuck them in the ass in front of their mothers? Yeah. yeah. You know, what the fuck causes that on this planet? And, that, and not just one guy doing it. It's, it's, it's across the board. It's a sickness happening to many, many soldiers. It's a power trip, it's a game, and they're all, and it's a blackmail, and they're all as sick as each other, and they hate themselves when they come back. My, my friend's brothers and sisters are in, in there, and their lives are fucked, man. Yeah, and then, and then these people come they're, back, they're going, they come back broken, you know, with PTSD, and, and, then, and then we're supposed to feel sorry for them, <laughs> because they, they chose to go over there. I and, do, that's and, my that's I do feel sorry for them, and I do believe they can heal, but I think that they might need some serious kind of metaphysical healing, like um, shamanistic medicines and plant medicines, spirit medicines. I think that the average psychologist can't deal with their problems. I think most of them don't want to heal because they hate themselves, because of all the shit they did. And, you know, that's why they all kill themselves, because it's easier to kill yourself, but it doesn't end there. That's the beautiful thing about eternity, is that you, that's just when it begins. Yeah, 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 it's, it's quite... Well, many people say, oh, not everyone has a conscience, Alyssa. You can't, re- you can't leave things to natural law because most people don't have consciences. You're the only one with a conscience. It's like bullshit. Every single being has a conscience. Every single being has a conscience. And just because we don't listen to our conscience at times or for our whole lives, like if you're a severe atheist and you don't see the interconnectedness of all things, like some atheists can still somehow have a very spiritual leaning, but it might not be God-like, but, you know, they still recognize that even though there's no God, things are divine. You know, but a lot of atheists, that, that's the, the sort of belief system that can allow you to be like, well, I can do anything because everything just, you know, nothing matters. Everything just rots in the ground. Like, I can do something to someone and when they're dead, the story's over. But it's not like that, I don't believe. I, I mean, my knowledge from my experiencing de- life after death with people, you can watch some of my videos to learn about that stuff, with mediums and, and things like that, is that we don't die we don't end when we die and we do get a chance to deal with our life's conundrums even after we pass sometimes but maybe that's just conjecture that's useless for some people but I'd like to say I used to massage a guy who was a Vietnam vet in Australia and I was like oh it must have been terrible the war when I was first massaging him about 10 years at the start I massaged him for maybe 10 years and he used to say War? No, mate. We were young boys and we were, we were, got, we were getting a, a plane ticket overseas. And when we got there, we were given guns and uniforms to tramp around. He said every time we got a haircut there, we got a head job at the same time. Like, we were getting our dicks sucked and our heads shaved and we had a gun. And we, it was fun for us boys, you know. Even though they did have to kill gooks, you know, or Vietnamese people, as most people know them. Yeah. So um, I said to him, you know, when did your conscience kick in? He was like, when I first met him, he was like, well, you don't have a conscience, mate. Everyone's doing it. It's war. Hmm. <laughs> but by, the, by the end of the time I'd known him, 10 years later, he was saying to me, you know what? I'm starting to see ghosts in the mirror when I shave, yeah. when I shave my face. Yeah. And he told me I killed eight people in Vietnam. And two of them I killed by hand and six of them with bullets, like in the, in, he shot. Yeah. But two of them he g- killed by yeah. hand. And he said those two are in his fucking mirror while he's shaving in the mornings. And he's like 75 years old now. So it's amazing. He had 30 good years going, I don't have a conscience. I'm fine about the war. I don't regret it. I've made comfort with myself. I've made peace with myself. But deep down in him, there was these little ghosts waiting to appear in the mirror to make him realize that he took two lives, you know? But they may have taken his life in another time or they may take his life next life. Who knows? If he doesn't, 
if they don't forgive him, they might want to get back in some way in some, I don't know, it depends. It's all just conjecture, but I know that energy can't die and I've been to a lot of mediums. I've done research on mediums for 20 years and I really believe that some people can connect with the dead and that when we're dead, we're still, can, we're still intact as our, our self, not so much our ego, but our soul. And our soul contains all of our lives as well as this one right now. Yeah, and one of the reasons that I do write and, and do make my videos and do and the interviews is because I want to leave a lasting record of my thoughts, right, for the future. And, yeah! You know, so it's a way, it. it, it's a way to gain immortality in a sense, right? In, in, in the same way that musicians, when they, yeah. or, or composers, when they compose music, that, that's basically immortal. That carries their, their, the soul Absolutely. of them throughout the ages, right? Um, so that's yeah, a, uh, it's the Akashic record records everything, but music is so beautiful the way it's recorded in us and anyone who ever hears it. Like when I used to play gigs, I played in a lot of cafes and, and bars where everyone was talking and my little pathetic songs were so quiet and I'm just noodling away in the corner. But I really didn't give a shit <laughs> because I know that people are getting it in their Akashic record for eternity. It can never be burnt out of their soul. Their, their ear might not be listening to every single word, but it's they're, they're stuck with my song in their cells forever. You know, so I'm, I'm not comfortable with that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and you know, talking about the you know the dead and uh, and you know eternity of uh, of of, the, of our souls. You know, I, I remember a quote which said, um, "An atheist is a, a or a dead atheist is a man." Who's dressed up uh, to go nowhere? <laughs> dressed up nicely. <laughs> <laughs> right? That's cute. <laughs> that is really cute. You know. Um, so I just reckon. I, I always say I was an atheist, and I'm so glad I was brought up an atheist because the Bible really fucked me up. I was like Easter bunnies, chocolate, Jesus, Mary, Virgin. I don't get it. Yeah. But my dad basically said, "Darling, it's all bullshit. We came from apes." So I was like, oh, cool, we came from apes. <laughs> but a few things about that worried me, like the fact that my friend really looked like an ape and also the fact that <laughs> there were still apes at the zoo. I was like, are they going to mind being in the zoo when they become human? But anyway, <laughs> I realized they didn't evolve that fast. Yeah. But uh -huh. I, when I took magic mushrooms at age 18, I found God. I found God in every leaf, in every grain of sand, in every apple, in every Saturn galaxy, in every thing and in no things, in every space and in every place, in everything that was, may ever be and may never be. All of that is the p potential that is God. And, and, you know, people go, I don't believe in God. I go, God doesn't give a fuck what you believe. You know, you are God. You don't need to believe in yourself. I can fucking see you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I usually tell people, like, I grew up also basically atheistic, uh, you know, no religion, basically. And I studied world religion, basically, on my own, you know, Judaism, Buddhism, Hinduism. Um, and, uh, you know, I found all of them to be fascinating. I was reading the Bible at one time. Um, I never finished it though. It was like halfway through it, <laughs> but I just read it. At, I just got to like Stephen. Stephen begat Michael. Michael begat Trevor, and yeah. I was like, "Get yeah, fuck." I like I like the way Voltaire describes the Bible. He says, "If you look at it from a pure, purely literary perspective, you know, it's it's a nice, entertaining book, <laughs> and that's about it." <laughs> you know, it's a book of fiction. That's what Voltaire, it is. One of my favorite writers. Voltaire is like Oscar Wilde. On every page, there is so much philosophical genius that it makes me. Voltaire makes me realize how retarded intellectually people are now compared to in the 1600s. Yeah. If that was common in the 1600s, work like that. Imagine if someone laid one of Voltaire's works on us today. <laughs> yeah. Imagine if somebody just went, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I love Voltaire. It would be. It would so exciting that it's not going to happen because we aren't that smart anymore. We're not that philosophical. We've been fucking ruined. But some of us have little aspects and moments of clarity. But we I just found, I always found Voltaire fantastic. But we have common core, so, you know, we should be getting smarter soon, right? <laughs> well, that's what they tell us, you know, like, 
I actually, I, I, there's a guy called Chris Cantwell, and he's an anarchist, and I read one of his articles. It was really funny, and I was like, he's cool. <laughs> and then I went and sort of liked his site or whatever, and then I saw he was advertising smart drugs like nootropics, and I'm like, guys, 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 <laughs> you can't make yourself smarter with smart drugs. <laughs> Just take some freaking good food. Yeah. Oh, God, and breathe. Can exercise, move the blood around in your limbs. <laughs> You're not gonna. A pill is not gonna fucking help your brain. You know what is good for your brain though? Marijuana doubles brain cell growth in rats. Oh yeah, awesome. <laughs> yeah, I'm not a big. I, oh, I've never know. really. I've never really big big into uh, drugs or anything. But uh, I have no problem with them. You know, I. Uh, I. Uh, people are free to do what they want. You <laughs> know. Time. That's the beauty of uh, volunteer. Yeah, well, I was gonna say. Johns Hopkins or Stanford or one of those CIA sponsored MK Ultra universities says it's good for you. So I reckon make up your own mind. <laughs> exactly. Cool. So I don't want to take up any any more of your time, uh, but let people know where they can find your work, your blog, your your writing. Okay. Thank you, darling. Um, well, if anyone's coming to Anacapulco or has any urge to ever go to Mexico, come to Anacapulco in two weeks. Uh, the 24th or the 25th of February, there are workshops starting, and there's awesome workshops. There's the unschooling parenting workshop. There's a – Luke Radowski is doing a change media, learning how to be uh, – Independent journalist workshop, which is, you know, you can't learn from anyone more cool than Luke. He's really, he, he fucking walks his talk. And somebody, it, somebody's doing an entrepreneur's camp. It's a really good festival. A lot of speakers about Bitcoin and precious metals and all sorts of different people thinking outside the box. Really going to be an interesting conference. A bunch of anarchists in one place. I suppose what we'll eat each other's children. We'll probably get <laughs> naked, fuck each other. They'll we'll, they'll be speeding. We'll be. What else do people do when there's no police? Raw milk. They'll be littering. Yep, raw milk. Drugs. Marijuana. <laughs> they'll be raw milk. I'll be squirting raw milk everywhere. <laughs> I buy raw milk up the road here in Mexico. It's lovely raw milk. Oh, I love it. And if it kills me, at least I died it's happy. Un unregulated and, um, lemonade stands. What else? Uh, unregulated lemonade stands. I assume. Yeah. <laughs> you can't have those. Awesome. <laughs> and I've got yeah. Well. Un unregulated all sorts of things but then uh, elissahawk.com is my blog and that's where you can find out how to make marijuana medicine where my new film is and it's not a film it's like a five minute YouTube and it's retarded I'm not Steven Spielberg but the, <laughs> it shows you the steps and then my retreats come to Mexico and have a yoga and massage and juice retreat the, the website is Coco Locas dot wix dot com slash coco locas slash retreats awesome yeah, I'm gonna, I'll put that and in, I'll, I'll give that email or something yeah. yeah I'll put that in the description of the video so, so, so the, the people can access that easily thank you well, thanks for thanks for seeking me out for a chat I love all that you do on Facebook and I love watching your comedy but I love that you're an, a, a really sensible anarchist on Facebook. You're the sort of anarchist that I show my parents to and I go, <laughs> Mum, Dad, look. Look at what anarchists are today. They're fucking lovely and we should all be. <laughs> well, I'm sure. So thanks for having me, darling. No problem. Thank you. Uh, but, uh, however, I'm sure my, uh, my family, my wife's family would disagree with you on that one but <laughs> that's their thing. <laughs> Awesome. Uh, look, I've never been married, but I've been enough in love to know how shit it can be and how good it can be. So just enjoy the good and the bad. Enjoy it all, man, because it's a really special thing. Yeah, it's very difficult to enjoy my mother-in-law, but I, I try. <laughs> <laughs> I love that you do mother-in-law jokes every 15 minutes. I can't believe your wife even stays married to you. You made jokes about mother Oh my God! She'd get out the feather duster. Oh my wife! My wife, she had a lot of a lot of great material with my wife. That was that was a 
Very important. <laughs> and you know, by the way, my wife never went to yeah. one of my shows. She never attended one of my shows. Well, that's good. <laughs> that is good, Danilo. Trust me. My parents would never have let me go on American Idol as a contestant either. Trust me. Sometimes it's good that your people around you are not your fans <laughs> because it, it makes you strive harder. It does. And you know what else? You know, everyone's meant to be different. It's good. It's really good. It's cool. Yeah. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Elisa, for the conversation. No uh, worries. Uh, thank you, Danilo. And thank your wife for being the way she is because, you know, that's going to make you better. It's going to make you strive harder. Yes. I think uh, we, uh, you know, she teaches me stuff about, you know, things that I need to learn and vice versa. So we're both learning. <laughs> she sounds like a good woman. Good. Okay. Well, <laughs> awesome. I'll have to meet her one day and you too in person. Hopefully, yeah, definitely. If we get down to Mexico one day. So thank you very much. This is uh, Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network and the Conscious Resistance uh, Network. Wishing all of you have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye. <laughs>